So this is the cast on bonnet that we're gonna make today. This is actually the bonnet that I show in the video after I've finished it and have used it to cast on, showing that it's a wonderfully easy project that anyone can make. This cast on bonnet is gonna be made on any cylinder you have, um, any number of slots on any machine. It's very easy to do and it just requires that you have successfully been able to knit with your machine, um, your needles are oiled, and latches are behaving, etc. So uh, first thing we want to do is to cast on with your machine. All right, so ideally you can use any fiber you want with the cast on bonnet. I prefer to use sock yarn because it does have a bit of stretch. I found um, the acrylic fiber ones that I've made, they just don't feel nice. They don't look great and they just don't have that nice kind of stretch. So what we're gonna do is we're going to advise you at this point to cast on using your preferred method. Now, if you have yet to successfully cast on, perhaps you'll wanna pause the video and manage that before we proceed. For a easy and straightforward approach on being able to cast on, feel free to check out my website at csmlove.com. I have a category on my page called learning and creating. And under that category uh, for a wide variety of cast on videos from the internet, check out the page called CSM Video Hotlist YouTube. Now this link that I'm just mentioned and the, my website will be listed in the YouTube description. If you need to click on a link easily, there it will be. All right, so what we wanna do is we wanna cast on at this point. So pause the video and cast on. I myself am going to use my universal cast on bonnet because it's quick and easy and I like them. So if you want more information on that, you can check my video and or the description for a link on that as well. All right, so let's pause and cast on. Use your preferred method. All right, so here we are, all cast on. I prefer to start most of my projects, if not all of my projects, at the three o'clock position. This is that position here on my cylinder. So what I've done here is I've just knitted enough rows for scrap, probably could have worked much less, but why not? And I have finished knitting with so that the last needle down is the one just before my three o'clock position. The next needle hasn't yet knitted on the scrap. So at this point, I want to change to my project yarn, which I'm going to do by cutting under my scrap yarn at the source. So not here, but over there by the ball, I've cut it and I'm going to move the scrap. I'm going to add my project yarn by a simple knot and by adding it at the source you can just fish it through much easier without having to re-thread your machine. So I'm just going to pull down until my scrap yarn or yeah my scrap yarn is done and my project yarn is ready to knit on this first needle. All right so I'm just going to hold it here make sure the yarn slack is taken care of with a little of a tug pulled back on the source and make sure your latch is open the previous stitch is under the latch and the new project yarn is in the hook there we are and almost completely do a row and stop now i like to take care of my yarn tails while they're on the machine it's way easier to work them in so what I like to do is I like to just thread them in. So I am just going to take the tail that's there and not the first needle that knitted, but the second one, just gonna gently wrap it without being too tight, maybe four needles and just hold the tail. And that way I won't have to sew anything later off the machine. So there we go. So now we have completed one complete row. So reset your row counter or just keep track. Now what we're gonna do, this design involves 
a hung hem at the bottom of your cast on bonnet. You can do any number of rows, but I prefer something substantial so that it's easy for your, your buckle and weight to hang from them without slipping off. So I'm gonna do a complete number of rows, maybe about 20. So let's do 20 now. I'm just gonna note my counter here to zero and let's do 20. If you don't have a counter, just count 20 manual rows. Here we go. And you wanna stop maybe at six o'clock, which for us is here. Now it doesn't have to be precise. It's a, just a hung hem at the bottom of an item. So we're gonna stop at six, which is where it is right now, because anytime we need to do something ahead of the carrier, we need to make sure we stop before that time. All right, so here's three o'clock again, and what we're gonna do here is we're gonna start doing a hung hem. Hung hem should always happen ahead of the yarn carrier. We are working in forward, so this means the yarn carrier is going around the machine counterclockwise. So we want to make sure the first hung hem stitch will be this first one after three o'clock. So we're going to take our stem weight, weights off the machine. And in case you don't know what a stem weight is, a stem weight, I believe all machines have them, is a puck with a stem. I like to use that that I just showed you plus two pucks. Now you can use one or two, but I just tend to use those two extra. There we go, now they're stacking. And how they're attached on my machine is a buckle. This is the item here. Let's continue. Now that we've taken the weight off the bottom of the knitting, we want to identify where the first row of knitting is. So when you look at this, you can see that there's orange, which is my scrap, and then there's this gray. So the question most people give me is, which row is the first row of knitting? So actually, it's this gray one right here. So this is the one that we are now, the first row, gonna hang on every needle from three o'clock. So in order to make that easy to identify, we're gonna look inside the machine, since we've taken the weight off, and be gentle, don't take the, the work over the needles or you'll drop stitches, and just identify where your, your scrap tail is, because that was the stitch just before three. So let's look at that, here we go. So there is your three o'clock and we're gonna look at it. This is your scrap la scrap tail. So this is the one before. We wanna have the gray stitch next to it. So this is what we call a pearl bump. We want its neighbor, the next one. And because we worked in our yarn tail, make sure that you are hanging the right one. I guess we could do that one. Let's see here. All right, so I just identify the next one, which is this. Doesn't matter if you catch two stitches on this first one. Then we just hang it on that first needle after three. So now the question is, what do we now hang? Well, this is very straightforward because all of our needles are in work. So this next needle here, we will locate this next bump, which is this one, and just hang it. And you just do that all the way around. This is how we create a hung hem. The good part about this, beyond the awesome design, we'll cut that extra tail later, um, is that this captures all the live stitches, so nothing should undo if you capture all these bumps. Kind of just locks it in. So do this all the way around, 
as you work on every single bump, every single needle, you'll find yourself working closer and closer to where the yarn carrier is. So we will advance it with some downward pressure once we get there, but don't go too fast. So just continue doing this all the way around till about here. I'm gonna pause the video now and get there for you. Okay, I worked my way over to where I mentioned. So now what we need to do is we need to proceed with working the final amount of the row before we hung the hem. So I just want to use your hand to pull down and it'll allow the fiber to kind of hang down. If you find that there's, it's, it'll be a bit uneven now that we have more fiber in one area, it's longer here. So what you can do is just reach in and just pinch it and just pull down gently. All right, and we just want to act, move the yarn carrier just to about here. So here we go. Making sure your prior stitches are flush against the machine. And then I'm stopping just about before three. So now the rest of these are able to have the hanging of that first row, which is what a hung ham again is in this example. So I'm gonna continue hanging and I'll put you on hold in the meantime. All right, here we are again. We've worked our way across and now we just have these stitches here that haven't been hung yet. What you're gonna do is you're just gonna hold down with your um, left hand gently because this next segment has already been hung so you don't have to worry about any baggy fiber. Whereas this is kind of baggy because when I pull down, it's not pulling down all of the fiber because this goes down and then comes back up and then it goes down to the bonnet, if that makes any sense. So let's just go forward, pulling down gently with our left hand. Watch the fiber, make sure that it is doing what it's supposed to. Now, because there are now um, two stitches prior on the needle and yarn being fed through, there's a bit more tension. So expect that, that's totally normal. All right, now that we've advanced, we'll finish hanging these last few uh, stitches. Uh, let's hold the video for that. All right, we're back and I have these last two needles or three needles to hang. So when we look here, this, these are the last three needles before three o'clock. So here's my pearl bump hanging. And then this gray one and this last needle still before three doesn't have one but it, there is one right here hiding so there we've hung all of the first rows of stitches on the machine now we're going to return our buckle eye to the sky and open so we can put the bonnet through the bottom of that that we use to cast on and then i turn the eye to the floor and then i've added my weight stack to the hook the eye of my my buckle. All right, so now we've done the hung hem on the bottom of our bonnet. That's the design we're going to go for. I prefer an open uh, bottomed cast on bonnet because that allows you full access to everything inside the machine. Some people choose to close the bottom of their cast on bonnet and put a hook there or a ring, something you can hang your stem weights directly from. That's an option. I don't prefer to do that because at one point you'll need to add your buckle anyways as your project gets longer, like for a sock. So why not just have full access? That's just my opinion. All right, so at this point you wanna create enough of a cast on bonnet that it goes below the machine and will have enough length when you go to use it in the future that you can easily hang your stem weights and your buckle from. So my rule of thumb generally is to create one bonnet that works, that rather is lower than the bottom of my crank wheel. So here's my crank wheel here. So I wanna work my project so that the bottom of my cast on bonnet will be maybe four fingers longer than, uh, than where this length underneath the machine is. I know it's not specific, but it's a good rule of thumb. When the project, any projects on your machine and there's weights, it's gonna seem much longer than it actually is. After it's off the machine, it's rested and it's been maybe washed, 
The actual gauge or stitch size won't be known until then. But we're not worrying about that stuff. We just want to have enough of a, a project cast on bonnet so that when it's off the machine and it's time to use it, there's enough material in which to use. More material is better than less. So there's just my rule of thumb how long we want to make it when it's on the machine. So at this point, I'm going to pause the video and we're going to come back with a project length of that length. Okay, there we go. All right, so here's a quick view of the bonnet worked until about the area or length I suggested. What you see here is the stem weight hanging on my buckle, my cast on bonnet that I use to cast on. This is the hung hem, of course, in the 20 rows I used. You can use less, it's really all preference. And then the rows I worked until I got the approximate length that I wanted. Again, it's always better to be slightly longer than slightly short because when it's long on the machine, stretched out and weighted, it'll be short when it's off the machine later. So I did about, what is that, about 70 rows. Not fully, but something like that. But how many rows you would need really depends on how tight your stitch gauge creates the stitch at. So honestly, go by how long versus how many rows. So that's what that looks like. Let's pause this and get you set up again for the next step. So the next step is to create the Pico. And that is the area that looks like this. Now, today's bonnet is not going to use rings. It's just going to have these Pico stitches. So basically from three o'clock, which we are too far ahead to work at. Let's do a little bit there. So now we'll start from three o'clock. We'll start doing the Pico edge, which is basically put one stitch on its neighbor and then repeat all the way around. So instead of 72 stitches that we have here, we will see only 36, which is half of 72, with two stitches on each needle. So that's what that looks like with a ring. Imagine it without the ring. You can make cast on bonnets with or without rings, okay? All right, so that's what that looks like at this point. Let's put this down. So to do that, it is very easy. Starting from the first needle after three o'clock, you take your stitch tool and bringing the needle forward towards you allows you easy access to it. Pick up to that stitch and just simply put it on its neighbor and repeat all the way around. So you will have a blank needle, a needle with two, a blank needle, a needle with two, etc. all the way around. So I'm gonna pause the video and you can continue doing that. So do this all the way to approximately here and then we'll check in again, okay? All right, we're checking in again. And as you can see, from three o'clock. We've done that all the way around and that's why it looks like what you see. Now we're gonna finish doing the row up until uh, three o'clock or thereabouts. We can work past three because these areas have already been prepared. And this Pico row is only done in one complete row. So what we can do here, because there's still weight on our machine, we could just simply advance the yarn carrier to about here. So let's do that. Now we need to finish doing the Pico from here where we stopped to the untreated needles all the way to those needles before three o'clock, which are over there. Perfect. So I'm gonna pause that and continue doing that off camera. All right, so now we finished doing the Pico application all the way around. Every needle that has that happen has two stitches on it. Why do we do that? We do that because with using a cast on bonnet of any kind, we only ever need every second needle loaded. 
To do more is just overkill. Why would you do the extra work? The other benefit to doing it this way is it allows you to have kind of a reinforced kind of point that when you either apply the ring before we do this procedure or while you do this procedure or just leave it as it is so that there'll be a loop of fiber um, that'll be hung on later onto your machine to use this, this just allows it to be a little more robust and strong. So we've done our Pico row, which is basically all we need to do at this point. Now what we'll do is we will work a number of rows so that we can finish what this will later be, which is what I call a off machine hung hem. Um, so what that means is we will finish the top edge of your bonnet. So I'm gonna show you a flat cast on bonnet, but the premise is the same. So we worked our bonnet up here, which is this area up here. We did the pico, which is what you're seeing here, all the way around. And then we're gonna work the remaining rows, which are these here, whatever length you wanna do. I usually do, let's see here, five, six rows thereabouts. And then we will stop. So our next stitch will be a scrap just after three and we'll add scrap and finish. Take it off the machine and then some off machine finishings. So at this point, I am going to work six or seven more rows just as I am. So reset my counter or count in your head. Doesn't matter how many rows you really do. There we go. So there's about nine, 10, and I'm gonna stop just before three. There we go. So the next stitch that we'll knit here will be the needle after three. I'm gonna cut our project yarn now, and we're gonna cut it at my source. So I don't have to thread the top part. We're gonna add scrap to the machine where the yarn source was so it can be threaded again through the top part with any extra work done, it makes it easier. So again, we're gonna do what we did before. So scrap is loaded. I'm gonna hold it with my finger and just work. So usually when I add scrap, I recommend to at least five to 10, if not 15 rows, or the width of your thumb, approximately. All right, so now we can take this off the machine or do another bonnet if you prefer. I'm gonna show you how to do that. At this point, I'm not switching the yarn. I'm gonna take it right off. So I'm gonna cut it, take it off my yarn carrier. I am going to take the weight off the machine from the bottom. Take the buckle off the bottom. This is all weight. And now I'm gonna use my hand to gently hold down and slowly advance the carrier so all the stitches pop off, which is what I want. Perfect. Great, so now we're done with the machine. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna hand finish this. And I will show you that next. All right, so this is what it looks like. Very easy. So the first thing you wanna do is separate your project from your scrap yarn. It's actually quite easy to do. Um, especially if you have used a fiber that isn't too old, so you can cut it and pull on the project. So, because you used a scrap that is having a high contrast, you can easily tell where the orange is scrap versus the non-orange. So what I recommend doing is I'm more of a cautious person versus someone who just willy-nilly. So what I like to do is I like to make multiple cuts. So I'm gonna cut one leg of the orange stitch and I'm gonna turn it around and somewhere else on that first row, I'm gonna cut another leg. Be sure that you're just cutting scrap. And maybe one more. 
taking a leg of your scrap and just cutting. All right, so now what you can do is just find enough that you can grab of your initial row, the scrap, and pull. There, and then a good part of it should come off. And then once again, and this is separating your scrap from your project. There we are. Some people use a product called Ravel Cord, and it's not really a product, but a reference to the type of features a certain type of fiber has. I have a video, I'll add the link. It's very cool. All right, so this is actually ca catching. There we are. So I'm just gonna continue. Now that's all that's left. So we wanna grab some orange scrap and just pull it. There we go. So now our project, our cast on, are separate. So this is what it looks like. I'm gonna turn it inside out actually. So this is what a hung hem looks like on your project. So that first row of stitches has been locked in and it won't undo. And I recommended when we were building this that you use a sufficient fold over on your hung hem so that when you add, when you use it later and it's all done, when you add your cast on bonnet, which is what this is, you'll apply your buckle like that and then you put the weight on it and it'll, it'll nicely sit because there's a nice thickness here of your hung hem. Whereas if you'd done a really short one, if your fiber was a bit slippery, it would slip right off much easier. So having a bit of a thickness there is quite useful. And what some people do is they close this and they put a ring so that when they add their weights later, they just hang it. But I don't like doing that. Anyways, so obviously the start is now completely done, but something needs to happen with the end where the live stitches are. Now live stitches, of course, excuse me, are being trapped by the scrap. And that would be that very final row of kind of beige yarn there. So what we wanna do is we wanna join that final row with an area that matches up somewhere down here. All right, so let's turn it inside out so we can see everything. And I'm sure you could think of or seen other ways of doing this, but this is my preference. I like this because the edge is quite stretchy. Um, as an example, the cast on bonnet that I had, this is what it looks like when you're done. And it's very stretchy. So this is that same idea where the final row was just using a darning needle sewn into the parallel row of stitches. So I'll show you that real quick. It's very easy. All right, what would have made this even easier as if since I worked, I was, how many rows was that anyways, 10? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So I worked 10 rows after the Pico. Would be easier had I run a lifeline and then worked the 10 rows, then in the Pico, and then finish with the 10 rows. And that's okay if you don't know what a lifeline is. It would have simply been a row of marks that I could sew it together easier, but I'm actually pretty good at doing this. So I don't always need to do a liner row. Where'd my needle go? There it is. Okay. So get your darning needle, which is what this is. Just a big eyed, easy to put yarn in needle. Move all your toys out of the way. There we go. And so what we want to do is we want to fold it over. 
so that the area where your first row is parallel to where the area is on your bonnet. We don't want it to be uneven, so having marked that row does help. So what I like to start with is I like to, you can see my last stitch came up, over, and then down. So this is where I am. So what I like to do is just go through that last loop and just make sure nothing's overly loose. You want it to look the same, but don't overly tighten it. So now that we've secured that stitch, I simply pinch so it's parallel and see where it lies on my row of knitting. And approximately there. So I will recognize the bump and run through this bump and then the one I just went through. So now all we do is we proceed along. So let me get this scrap tail out of the way. There we are. So now as you can see we want to aim for that row each bump. So this one and this one and this one and this one and this one. If you have a self striping yarn, sometimes a row of color will appear in one line and it'll make this even easier. But it's really not that hard. If you mess up, you can undo it. It's a bit of a pain and use some stitch markers and redo it. It depends how much it bothers you with anything. All right, so identifying that is this one. And then here, this is this one. All right, so here we go. And now I want the next one, the last row there. And it's very easy, you just pull it up and then repeat. For extra information on this, I will provide a link in the write-up because I have posted previously this off machine bind off. There we go. So you just continue all the way around, trying to stay on that same project row and the last row of stitches. You're simply just securing them. And this is how I do it. You can use whatever other method you prefer but this is how I do it. Okay. It's a bit of a knot happened. The trick is to go the other way. There we go. And you can see it's already sitting nicely. Alrighty. So this is kind of repetitive here. So I'll do a couple more and then put it on pause as I work all the way around. So it's this one. And I would say you could just count up so many stitches from the color, but if the color changed, then that would not be a very good guide. So a couple more. It's not hard. You can see I'm not over tightening it, holding it, um, vertical so you could see the rows helps if you hold a diagonal it doesn't help all right so I'm now going to pause it do some more off camera and then come back all right we've come back we're almost completely done sewing in those stitches so I just want to do the rest of it on camera here we are so easy be easier if I put it down to work but my alignment with the camera well Hopefully you can see. Alrighty, securing those last few stitches. Okay. They should line up if you did it right. There we go. 
and there we go so that's what it looks like so now we'll just put that aside now we want to separate the scrap from our project and we just did that so it's really not all that hard using the same idea flip it in a way that you can more easily see the orange legs as I call them take your scissors and gently just close or cut the scrap leg that you can identify I tend to do at least three now I chose to make this today on a fairly loose stitch size. So it's very easy to see. And there's not too much unwanted tension. So already look at that, it's gorgeous. Now you don't, you didn't have to do such, so many stitches after the Pico, you really could have done any number, but you know, why not make something robust? Cool. And there's a few designs I played with initially with making these. And that included making more than one row of Pico. So if one row died, you'd still have another area you could hang on the on the machine to, to use as a cast on bonnet. And that works. All right, identify your scrap. Sometimes it pulls out easy, sometimes it misbehaves. If you have to use your stitch tool and or your scissors, just be careful not to cut your project yarn. All right, there we go. Also, and be careful that um, you didn't sew in partial bits of yarn. If you hadn't used a blunt darning needle, you might have gone through um, a bit of fiber instead of around it. And that could mean that you'd have to cut this out in places. So there we are, we're removed. So this is what the inside looks like. Perfect. All right, so truly finish it. Take your needle, which you still have dancing around on it. You don't really need to tie a knot. You just need to pass through a bunch of stitches, kind of secure it. What I like to do is just see which way you can easily go without it being obvious that there is a yarn tail there. And honestly, I just kind of zigzag through this is so stretchy, you'll have no problem with it. So at this point, I'm just gonna take the needle and just kind of zippity-boo, kind of go here and there. The more uh, zigzags I go, the better it'll be. Sometimes I like to go on a bar there and just kind of make a bit of a knot that isn't a knot, just a loop. That way it secures it. And then pass in behind, just anywhere. Make sure you don't over tighten it. And don't go too far. You just want it not to easily come undone. I tend to probably go overboard here, but uh, Better to be slightly too long that you can trim than too short and it came undone. So a couple more passes. That's pretty much it. So one trick is just to pull it so it's tight and cut. And then when you do this, it sneaks inside. Perfect. All right, so this is our bonnet. It's actually inside out, so let's right side out. There we go. So this is what our bonnet looks like. Let's move all our stuff.
And how it's used now is you identify one of the loops and you hang it on each Pico. So we'll take it over to the machine and I'll show you how to use it. All right, so this is how you use the bonnet you just created to cast on. There we go. So you take your bonnet and it's a nice length that you're gonna easily have easy grip underneath the machine too. And you can either put it through the top, I like to put it through the bottom because that way I can't catch on any hooks. So with any cast on bonnet, you never apply it directly at the yarn carrier. I have a preference to apply it a minimum two to three fingers away, but more is better. So what I tend to do is I tend to apply it a bit further. So make sure all your latches are open and a lot of them are closed. So that's why I'm doing this. Identify a loop on your Pico area. and hang it. So then on your next Pico, you wanna hang it on the second stitch or second needle that you would use. So we cast on using every second needle. So on the next Pico, we identify once again the fiber we want and we hang it. So what I'm doing here on this is I'm identifying the right leg of a stitch on the pico and I'm hanging it. My preference is um, I prefer to use the split rings but here is a non-split ring way of making a bonnet and doing so reliably. So there you are. You just simply hang your bonnet. You see that there? Okay. And you just want to continue doing that all the way around. Okay. Now fiber bonnets are great for this. They're very flexible and easy to use. There we go. So I'm gonna pause the video and finish hanging a bit more. Actually, let's just continue here. This will be a little easier. Okay, so our yarn carriers here, um, we are going to relocate it now to over here. So slowly bring it over. I'm not knitting yet, so I don't have to worry about holding the uh, bonnet down. So now I'm gonna stop because it's right where it needs to be over here. Now we can hang these remaining needles, make sure all the latches are open. And again, we're just hanging every second needle on the cylinder using one of the legs, usually the same sided leg as your Pico. So maybe I will zoom in here so you can further see. There we go, can you see? it looks pretty clear. Okay, so there we go. So the Pico, that would be this one here. And the Pico is here, so it's this one here. So each knit stitch kind of has two legs. So I, that's what I mean by legs, two sides. I think knitters would know, but non-knitters may not know what that meant, sorry. Okay. So each Pico, there we go. Try not to split your fiber, which is 
easy to do because fiber is what fiber is. All right, so I usually stop before the end of all the raised needles. So what we'll do now is we will zoom out and add our scrap because we need to advance it. So my scrap is orange. I really enjoy using my hemostats. They're locking two and a half inch eBay, Amazon purchased items. And I'm just going to pinch it on my bonnet and then thread my scrap yarn through my carrier. It's ready. Now, what I want to do is I want to move my yarn carrier from where it is to maybe about here. In order to do that, with all cast on, you want to have weight. I'm going to temporarily pull down so that all of the cast on bonnet loops uh, will stay where they should be and the needles will do their stitches. So here we go. Perfect. All right. So now I'm going to let go and we're finished hanging the rest of the cast on bonnet. On the machine. So there we go. So maybe if you haven't been able to identify what I'm picking up on each Pico, you could see here, yeah, you could see here that it has a leg closer to my thumb and a leg closer to my hand over here. So one leg, two leg. Each stitch has legs. So we're taking, in this example, we're taking only the right one. And this will always be the one for this bonnet. Same, same, same is what we do when we are knitting anything. Do the same procedure all about. So every second needle, that same right leg, now that we're looking at it from this angle, there we are, there we are. And of course here, it's because this cylinder had this specific bonnet made on it, this is the right bonnet for just this cylinder. As you can see, oh, I did a mistake here. There's two needles here. What did I do? Oh, <laughs> see, it happens. Every second needle. Bada bing. There we go. All right, good. So now every second needle has a fiber loop on it. Now we're gonna add our buckle. Let's zoom out. Add our buckle. Eye to the sky, put the bonnet through it, and then add our stem weight and puck. Now we're ready to finish the first row. And there you are. We have a bonnet easily used to cast on. All right, so just let me show you what this looks like. When you make one a sufficient length, you have plenty of clampable areas with your buckle and you can easily use it. So there you are. Thank you for watching this video. Please stay tuned. Check out my website. And if you have any questions, just email me, karenramel at yahoo.com.